So hello, everyone. My name is Monica Lorenzo. I'm a researcher at the University of Aveiro in Portugal, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this angel seminar dedicated to research on teacher education. So this seminar was organized by Angel's Special Interest Group on Teacher Education, which is a member-driven initiative that examines the evidence and research on approaches to global education within teacher education provision. Uh, this initiative was launched in 2022, and the Executive uh, Six Committee consists of three conveners, myself, uh, Ben Malon from Dublin City University, Ireland, and Kudzia Kasum from the University of Dandy, UK. This year, the focus of the sixth seminar is education for sustainable development, a theme that has emerged as a key discourse in education in the past two decades. So an emphasis on ESD in schools has generated debates about teacher preparation programs, teacher agency for ESD, and the challenges regarding its implementation. So in this seminar, we will share practices and research related to teachers and ESD through four presentations. The first two will be focused on pre-service teachers and the remaining on in-service teachers. So I really hope that you enjoy the seminar. And now I will hand over the word to Ben to introduce our first presenters. Thanks very much, Monica. So our, our first presentation is entitled Student Teachers Understanding and Engagement with Education for Sustainable Development in England, Turkey and Pakistan. And the, the presentation is by Doug Bourne, Professor of uh, Development Education and Director of uh, DevEd Research Centre at University College London, um, IOE. Uh, Katsia Kalsoum is currently serving as a lecturer in the School of Humanities, Social Science and Law at the University of Dundee. Neshe Soisal is an independent researcher and the director at Edu for Global Consultancy in London. And Burchai Inch is an English instructor at Ghazi University. So uh, over to you all. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to just say a few words of introduction and then pass over to my colleagues, um, Neshe Kudisa and Burte. My, um, my involvement with this uh, initiative was that I've been involved in a number of conversations with the co-authors of this report over the last few years about how we can develop students, teachers' understanding of education for sustainable development and what that looks like in contrasting countries, different cultural and also um, practical teaching environments. Because one of the things I think we find from a lot of work, a lot of us involved in this area of work is that there's some assumption that the approaches are the same, same in terms of interpretation of what is ESD around the world, when of course they are very different. And so one of the things that we were particularly wanted to engage with was how um, student teachers saw their understanding of the terms and what was they saw the nature of their engagement. And with funding from my own university's um, Global Engagement Fund, we're able to can produce this piece of research, which is now available on the Development Education Research Centre's website. So that's all I want to say by way of introduction, and I'll pass over to um, Neshe Alberto, who's speaking for first, not quite sure. I will be speaking first. Okay, okay. So I'll just make a short introduction. So as we all know, uh, pre-service teaching period is very crucial uh, because this is the period where uh, pre-service teachers form their beliefs and views about their teaching, which will affect their whole uh, profession or career. And so thinking about the key role of teachers in the success of um, ESDs, let's say we, uh, we know that they should have a uh, uh, proper education or proper training on ESD. So uh, what we see is a research, research shows that if the uh, teachers do not have a proper understanding of ESD, it might have a negative impact on their students. And since they are going to be role models for their students in terms of ESD and of course, many other aspects, but this is really important. So um, Let's say this being the case, we wanted to find out uh, how, uh, let's say, pre-service teachers' uh, education uh, programs impact their conceptions of ESD. 
Uh, so we can have a look at our aims. So how do they uh, conceptualize education for sustainable development? And then uh, of, uh, another aspect is uh, their future commitment to ESD. So how are they planning to uh, implement ESD or their views on ESD into uh, their teaching? We wanted to find out about that. And uh, as the last part, we wanted to find out about the differences among three different countries because, uh, because we're talking about three different countries in three different geographical regions. Nesha, can you just change the slide? Yes. So our methodology is um, mixed method design. We have two different uh, aspects. Uh, we have the quantitative part where we developed a survey and then we uh, applied it online. And then we asked the students to volunteer uh, for the interview. Those students who volunteer to participate in the uh, interviews, they uh, made the qualitative part of the study and we carried out semi-structured interviews and then we analyzed these uh, data uh, separately and then uh, used them together for the interpretation stage. And our research context involves United Kingdom, uh, University College London, uh, which has a very uh, strong, uh, who is a very strong supporter of ESD, we can say. And then we have uh, University X from Pakistan and Gazi University and another university in, um, let's say, Turkey together forms this context. And our participants, you can see most of them are fourth grade students uh, at the age of 20, let's say. And you can uh, see the numbers uh, of responses in online survey and the number of interviews uh, that part, uh, carry out in each country. That's it. Thank you. And yeah, now I'm going to talk about uh, the quantitative findings and I could say we talk about the qualitative ones. Uh, about the student teachers conceptions, uh, we have given them an online survey and we asked them to uh, write their agreement according to the uh, Likert uh, scale type questions from one to five. Five means the highest one. As you can see, uh, the students from all the participating universities uh, view ESD uh, as a content related to sustainable development. And they mostly uh, see it uh, as a way of empowering people to take responsibility for present and future generations. And also in the number one, you can see that they see it as a body of knowledge about social, economic and environmental issues. However, the important point here is that they are not sure about ESTs employing learner centers and transformative pedagogies, as you can see it from item five and six. And uh, about their future engagement, we can say that uh, they are all committed to teach uh, about education for sustainable development as a content uh, regarding environment, uh, environmental aspects, uh, economic and the social aspects. Uh, from here, you can see that uh, in the universities uh, at, uh, in Pakistan, you see uh, they're almost in the uh, equal level to integrate ESDs, uh, different aspects. Uh, however, in Turkey and also in Turkish universities and also at UCL, uh, they mostly uh, would like to in integrate social issues to their content. And uh, regarding their values, uh, it is nice to see that they all want to uh, integrate uh, ESD values to their teaching. Uh, here again, we can see the level of uh, the university in Pakistan is a bit lower comparatively actually to the other universities. Uh, regarding the items, we can say that uh, at UCL, they mostly for want to promote uh, the value about open-mindedness. Uh, however, in uh, Turkey and Pakistan, they mostly focus on the respect for diversity. Uh, about the pedagogies, what we can say here, uh, you see the student teachers in Turkish universities and also UCL uh, are more committed to uh, including the pedagogies related to ESD in their teaching. Uh, as you can see, uh, the level of Pakistan here is a bit low. And uh, when you look at the items in detail, we can see that uh, at UCL, they mostly would like to promote critical questioning. Uh, in Turkey and uh, Pakistan, they would like to engage their students in collaborative learning activities mostly. And now, uh, 
we are going to talk about the qualitative findings, please. Let's see, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nashe. And um, okay. So uh, as a part of our research, we also asked the participants to mention, to share uh, how their universities are promoting education for sustainable development. So you can see from the statistics that 80% participants from the two Turkish universities, they mentioned that they, their universities um, offered a standalone course on education for sustainable development. This is very contradictory to the um, response of the student teachers from UCL and from uh, Pakistani University. Uh, in UCL, nearly 50%, of, uh, 48% participants mentioned that ESD is promoted as an underpinning philosophy of the whole teacher education program. And 36% uh, from Turkish universities, uh, uh, participants from the Turkish universities mentioned that ESD is developed as, uh, as an underpinning philosophy. Uh, the 34% uh, participants from Pakistan and UCL also mentioned that uh, the ESD is integrated in different other teacher education uh, uh, courses. So, uh, Nesha, can we move to the next slide? Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the qualitative findings. So we, we interviewed us. Uh, um, some uh, participants who volunteered uh, to participate in the interview. And uh, the interview data showed that most of the uh, participants uh, understood or conceptualized education for sustainable development as a set of topics or themes. So they mostly talked about ESD content. Uh, they, they didn't really mention ESD processes. And when we asked questions about ESD related skills or values, then they spoke about a certain skills and values. But interesting thing is that the values which they mentioned like literacy or numeracy or vocational skills, problem solving skills, these are the skills which are not found or mentioned in ESD literature specifically. So they did talk about skills, but they, their conceptions related to ESD skills were not fully aligned to the scholarly literature. When it comes to ESD content, the students from um, Turkish universities and um, Pakistani university, they uh, viewed ESD content mostly in terms of environmental content. On the other hand, uh, four participants out of five uh, from the UCL, they described ESD content more holistically. They talked about the complexity of um, the economic, uh, social, and environmental dimensions. And some of the students talked about ESD in terms of education for future. Uh, Nasha, can we move to the next slide, please? All right. So. Um, ESD, uh, uh, like uh, the quantitative data, qualitative data also showed that most of the students mentioned that um, uh, uh, teacher education, they, they didn't study teacher education, uh, they didn't study ESD as a standalone course in their teacher education program. Uh, but uh, they, they did talk about the importance of ESD in teacher education. And they suggested that there should be more activities to expose them to different dimensions of sustainability and ESD. And when we asked them about the strategy which they would use uh, in future to um, engage their students in sustainability education, they mentioned that they would be uh, using activity-based approach in their teaching. And they also mentioned that they would integrate sustainability content in, in different subjects. And uh, most of them talked about geography, social studies, and science uh, and uh, languages. These were the most commonly mentioned subjects where they want to integrate uh, ESD. And uh, the study showed that ESD in teacher education, in initial teacher education, the way it is integrated in teacher education actually impacts student teachers' conceptions about 
ESD. So if it is an underpinning philosophy of the whole program, then student teachers have more holistic conceptions of ESD. Uh, thank you. And now over to Professor Bond. I think for, for all of us, we saw this piece of research as the start of the dialogue between the universities and how we can in, encourage greater dialogue about how ESD is understood and perceived. I also think the sense in the, pro, in the process of conducting the research that the situations was changing within each of the universities. And I think one of the things I think is interesting is that how quickly this field of ASD and teacher education is changing because of external factors, whether it's what's happening from young people in society or even institutions themselves recognizing these things. And of course, in many universities, the sustainable development goals are becoming quite important as a way of um, driving some of these agendas forward, particularly in teacher education. So I think the sense of where it's located within individual institutions and so on will always vary because of the structure of courses. But what I think we found was this increasing interest and it's, and it's a sense of how the institutions and how we as teacher educators actually catch up with the demand and interest from students. Thank you. Thanks for a really, uh, really interesting presentation to get us going. So um, our next presentation is entitled uh, GCD and ESD in English as a Foreign Language Teacher Education Voices from Hungarian University Language Development Classes. And this presentation is by um, Rita Devecki, who is a language teacher and teacher trainer at the Department of English Language Pedagogy at Urtbusch Lorand University in Budapest, where she is also um, a PhD candidate. So welcome, Rita. Thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, you can see my name up there and Benjamin very well pronounced uh, the institute where I'm working. Um, so in the next 12 minutes, uh, let me talk about the study that I conducted as part of my uh, doctoral research. So um, very briefly, I will walk you through um, the theoretical background so that you can see my motivations uh, for the study, the methods, the results, and uh, at the end, I will also offer you some of the implications of my study. Um, when I started my PhD studies, um, after diving into the literature on global citizenship education, I stumbled upon the Global Competence Framework, which was designed by uh, OECD PISA, and you can see the definition of global competence on the slide. Um, I've been using this framework to guide my inquiries ever since. And um, even though students' global competence can be developed um, anywhere, even outside of the classroom, um, I've been mostly interested in how it can be developed in EFI classes. So um, actually, out of the myriad uh, reasons why the EFI classroom can be a perfect space for nurturing our students' global competence, I only brought you four for obvious time reasons. But before getting to the reasons, here's one argument that I think is very, very powerful. So according to Starkey, if there is one set of skills that the global citizen ought to possess, it is the ability to communicate in languages other than one's own. So I think it's uh, from this uh, quote, it's quite evident that we can um, nurture global citizens in our um, language classes and why not in English classes. So um, I brought you four other reasons. And reason um, number one would be that global content is actually in the curriculum. Um, if we have a look at the EFA frame curriculum in Hungary, we will find topics like poverty, educational protection, famine, education, and so on. So um, it seems to be the and and this seems to be the case in in other countries too. Another reason is that um, as we um, so as we know, exams have quite a washback effect on what is happening in our classes, and students are actually tested on whether they can talk about local, global, and intercultural issues. If we have a look at any um, language test, we will find traces of global content there as well. Another reason would be that students in general seem to be interested in global uh, content. And um, if we choose content that emotionally and mentally engages our learners, then uh, we may be able to have fruitful conversations with them in the target language as well. And the last reason would be that um, by talking about such topics, we can develop our students for basic language skills, and also we can um, develop their 21st century skills. 
Now, uh, before talking about my own project, uh, let me very quickly walk you through uh, the present state of uh, global competence uh, development in teacher education in Hungary. Um, according to Monushi's study, there are only sporadic endeavors to incorporate sustainability related content in university classes. And whether this incorporation happens, it usually depends on uh, individual instructors' um, commitment to ESD or GCE. After having a look at the training and outcome requirements of English as a foreign language teacher education, I only found few references to trainees being required to have the capacity to nurture global citizens. But good news is that at least, uh, for example, they are required to be able to bring in news items into the classroom. Um, Fortunately, the intercultural aspect of teaching English is present in the requirements, and now teacher, uh, teacher trainees cannot uh, graduate without having heard of um, intercultural competence, for example. And um, I also conducted a study on uh, the content EFL teacher educators bring into their uh, language development classes, for example, and um, it turned out that even though they bring global and intercultural content into their classes, they tend to avoid local and issue, so local issues and issues that they deem controversial um, in, in, um, into their classes. The problem with this, of course, is that um, if students are not given the opportunity to talk about these uh, topics in um, in a shattered environment, then they are not going to feel encouraged to do that. And they won't feel that they can talk about such topics um, that well. So um, in this context, I aim to identify some good practices for global competence development in English as a foreign language teacher education. And I also aim to explore teacher trainees' views on activity sequences that I developed for global competence development. And I formulated the following research question, what are teacher trainees' views on activity sequences aimed to develop global competence? Uh, my participants were 140 first year EFL teacher trainees to whom I taught English language development classes. I did my classroom study in 13 of my groups and um, I created 10 worksheets revolving around global, local and intercultural issues. I had a research journal um, in which I wrote about my experiences. And after the lessons, the students were asked to fill in uh, feedback sheets uh, via Google Forms. Um, the data collection took place in two academic years, and um, in 2021 autumn, the study was also replicated in the, in the secondary school context with the participation of 12 um, EFL teachers and uh, their 158 uh, students. And then the data was analyzed using thematic content analysis. Um, when creating the worksheets, my main aim was to write up activity sequences with the help of which as many aspects of students' global competence could be developed as possible. But even though their main aim was to improve students' global awareness and understanding of global issues and also their language skills, um, the, the activities also help the students develop their global skills and attitudes um, as much as possible. And even though the activity sequences were quite diverse, there are some features that um, that made them similar to each other. On the slide, you can see the title of the worksheet, the topic, and also the language level and the skeleton of a typical lesson that I developed. Um, each sequence started with a warmer, usually for personalization purposes, and the students were given some authentic materials. Um, I tried to choose materials that the students would find appealing, like um, video clips and animations and so on. Um, then they were given some comprehension activities. We also exploited the materials for language, mostly for vocabulary development and um, for speaking purposes. And um, then the, the students were given some um, activities with the help of which they could learn a bit more about the issue at hand. And finally, they engaged in project activities uh, with end products like presentations, infographics, um, and even service learning activities. 
Um, as an example, I brought you uh, one of these uh, projects. So um, the activity sequence, what makes a good life, revolved around two topics, happiness and aging. And first, we watched a video um, by Robert Waldinger, What Makes a Good Life, um, in which he presented a 75-year-long study on, that he conducted on happiness. I really love this video, and fortunately, my students also loved it a lot. So we watched it, then we talked a lot about the topic. We also um, learned loads of new vocabulary items from it. And then the project, um, before the project, there were also um, activities with the help of which they could learn a bit more about um, loneliness in later life, um, some statistics as well. And after that, uh, they could choose between two projects. They could either um, create an infographic on loneliness in later life from the Hungarian context, um, they, they had to research the topic and then uh, create an infographic, or they could engage in a sort of experiential learning activity. So um, it was during the COVID period, and they had to interview one of their um, relatives or aging neighbors about important milestones in their lives, and then they had to report back their findings to the class. Um, so all in all, after analyzing uh, all my data sources, I found some emerging themes. They truly appreciated the um, up-to-date and relevant materials. Uh, it constantly came up in the feedback sheets that they really liked either the songs or the poems or the videos that I showed them. They felt that the, the lessons were useful, engaging and informative. They also appreciated the fact that these lessons offered a new take on topics that they had already discussed millions of times, such as climate change, for example. Um, they also liked the videos and songs. They felt that they were out of the ordinary. They felt that they were relatable. They also appreciated the awareness raising nature of the worksheets, and they felt that they actually learned something about the word, something new about the word um, in the lessons. And as a language teacher, I was happy to witness that they they actually so the activities contributed to the development of their language skills. But of course, students um, also voiced some constructive criticism, like uh, that some students didn't really like the creative activities, for example, when they had to rewrite poems. And some students also felt that I required too much work from them. So they had to put too much effort into the classes in this way. Um, here you can see a few quotes, and I don't really want to read them out, um, but there is one thing that I, I really um, like when, when reading these quotes, and it's that some students actually even changed their behaviors after, after some, or just pledged to change their behaviors in connection with some topics. Yes, so um, in conclusion, um, students mostly had positive views on the incorporation of, of these topics into language development classes. And I think one of the main takeaways could be that it's possible to show trainees the relevance of global issues by incorporating up-to-date interactive and pop cultural materials into your classes. Um, as for the implications, um, I think that there is a need for teacher-friendly, easy to use and free materials because mostly teachers are overworked. I don't really think that it's only the case in Hungary. Teachers are overworked and it's and um, if there is a bank of activities available, then it's going to make their uh, lives easier. Um, the study could also serve as evidence that it's possible to include um, global content in teacher trainees foundation courses with dual aims. And by discussing these topics and engaging in such experiential learning activities, our students could start becoming global citizens. And these activities may raise a desire in them um, to nurture global citizens in turn in the future um, once they are out there and teaching their own classes. So uh, here you can see my, um, my references and also Thank you very much for your attention. I put up uh, the my website as well. Um, if you follow the QR code, you are going to find my website there because I, I uploaded all the activities that I was talking about and they are free of charge, of course. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. That, that was uh, really interesting and great to um, see something <clears throat> in terms of uh, EFL. So uh, we'll move on to our third 
and presentation, which is entitled What Spaces Do Scottish Math Teachers Find or Make for ESD and GCE? And the presentation is by Karina Anger, who is a PhD student at Stirling University. So you're very welcome, Karine. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's going to be really interesting, actually, to follow on from the previous two um, presentations, because I want to suggest that perhaps if you've had um, inspiration in your um, teacher education and you've also got free free materials to use that possibly um, in some situations that still isn't enough. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a very small group of mathematics teachers I've been um, engaging with over the last few years. And I've also been working alongside Scott Deck, a development education center with these teachers um, to um, devise and to um, engage them in professional learning and to provide them with classroom materials. Um, these teachers are quite unusual, so um, one of the things that came out at the beginning of this project was that not many maths teachers sign up for professional learning um, in these topic areas, um, but I think probably what's, what's come out throughout the project is just how difficult it is for maths teachers and that they're struggling against such a strong hegemonic discourse about what maths is and how it should be taught. Um, that makes it very hard for them um, because they have to kind of accommodate a lot of that first. So I want to begin. I'm just going to read. This is a teacher who um, who's, was very excited by her um, teacher education and learning about the kind of potential there is in Scotland where learning for sustainability is part of government education policy. And she says, learning about inclusion, diversity and the whole learning for sustainability thing, I felt good about that. So she went into teaching wanting to achieve some of these things and then I became a teacher and it's hard to do these things it's really hard hard enough to prepare a set of lessons it's hard to do something that's not technically required of you it's a bit over and above and what's particularly interesting about that statement is that it is technically required of her that it is part of Scottish education policy to embed global citizenship in your teaching whatever subject and whatever age phase you're working with so it is given in policy um, and hence why we've been working towards um, equipping and supporting mathematics teachers to do this. But it's also taken away in practice because the discourse around other purposes of education and particularly the purposes of mathematics to gain qualification completely overrides. Um, and one of the places this discourse is coming from is from the educational inspectorate. And I'm, I'm not going to read these quotes, but Every single one of these quotes is about teaching in the very early years of secondary school. So before these young people are working towards public examinations, this is what's called the broad general education in Scotland. And yet every single one of these inspection reports is telling schools there should be more rigorous and structured monitoring and tracking of progress through assessment this is the message that our, the teachers are getting. And so here we have a second teacher who signed up for professional learning um, and was, again, really enthusiastic um, about what she wanted to achieve in her classroom. And she even says, not just for a qualification, but so they can shape a better world. Ultimately, I must empower my pupils so they can make a difference. Um, a couple of years later, I recorded a conversation with this teacher. She was actually at home that day because the government app had told her that she'd been in contact with someone with COVID and so she was not allowed to go into school. So she'd got a whole day at home. And in the conversation, she said to me, I need to do more. I'm so frustrated. I've not picked up on so many of the things I learned from you in my previous training. I've just not been doing it. And it makes me very upset. I think today how I could have used that time for planning all the things I could do instead of planning assessments. So basically she'd spent her day writing tests rather than um, engaging with, um, you know, developing how she might use more interesting activities in the classroom. So one of the ways I've been thinking about this is using an idea from um, a critical maths educator, Scott Mosey. Um, who talks about teaching and learning maths in two different ways. 
So he talks about the kind of tradition of exercises, the typical textbook with lots of little dull questions. And then he talks about what he calls the landscapes of imagination, which is the kind of mathematics teaching where you're dealing with much more interesting, bigger tasks where the learners are making conjectures, they're asking their own questions, they're exploring and making connections within mathematics. Um, and within each of those two strands, he talks about the context in which you present a mathematical task, whether it's a tiny little exercise or a much bigger engaging activity. So you might just simply make reference to pure mathematics. And so in the red triangle, what we've got is where most classrooms are, most secondary mathematics classrooms are doing things which are abstract, decontextualize lots and lots of tiny questions. Um, a few mathematics classrooms might be using a semi-reality where you sort of pretend, uh, oh, I'm going to open my, um, my drawer of socks in the dark and see if I'm going to take out two that make a pair. So they're often stupid and unreal and unconvincing to young people. And we know one of the reasons that that's one of the reasons young people are, are unimpressed with their mathematics. But it is also possible to use authentic contexts, um, real life data and real life situations. Um, and you can do that within the tradition of exercises or as I've been trying to do over the last five years to gradually move teachers towards something closer to a landscape of imagination. So this would be in the tradition of exercises. And this is one of the resources available free on the website from Scott Deck. And it looks like a worksheet. Um, so it looks very familiar to the maths teachers, but in fact, there's a few things in it to just disrupt the kind of normative experience of doing a maths worksheet. So there's some interesting contrast between the countries. There's some questions raised. Um, and the two of the teachers who reported on using this um, have one, one teacher discussed how the young people worked together and collaborated and actually taught themselves a little bit of mathematics, reverse percentage, which they'd never known before and not been taught. Um, by contrast, another teacher working with a high attaining group said that she thought they fully understood percentages and yet they couldn't even begin this worksheet because they were so completely surprised by the contextual nature of it. Um, so moving a little bit on from there and trying to adapt this tradition of exercises a little bit further, I then produced a series of resources like this, um, only to discover this was just too far. This was beyond what maths teachers were able to deal with in their classrooms or use. It doesn't look enough like a textbook or an exercise. It's got this crazy idea on the sides that you might have this discussion activity about the topic. Um, and it, it wasn't something that teachers found that they, they were able to, um, to, you know, to use in their classroom. So I kind of took a step back because the teachers I've been engaging with have wanted to do things and they have been enthusiastic about global citizenship um, and started to sort of look at, well, what actually are they doing? Um, and I found that they are finding spaces, sometimes even making spaces. Um, but in some senses, this is quite sad and quite worrying what's actually happening. So one of the places they're finding space is where progress of young people is considered to be limited or even completely stopped altogether. Um, so the young people may be following alternative trajectories and courses, or perhaps even out of mainstream schooling completely in an alternative setting. Or in one situation, the class was so unsettled and disruptive um, that you get the kind of um, the discourse of, well, it doesn't matter. You can do anything with these children because they're not going anywhere. You know, um, it's almost it's almost like saying, oh, there's no opportunity cost here. We've written these children off. Um, so whilst the teachers are really enthusiastic about these spaces and, and will describe in great detail how much they love using wider purposes of mathematics, different activities, connecting to the young people's experiences outside school, and they really enjoy working with the young people in these spaces, there is something underlying this that is, that is quite worrying about this is only being allowed because nobody thinks these children are going to achieve anything. Um, perhaps a little bit more hopeful 
is where the teachers have got a bit more pedagogic courage and they're actually prepared to step back and ask the young people what they would like to explore. And I have had some really lovely anecdotes of that happening. And interestingly, young people really want to know about taxation and they want to know about public spending. How does this work? So there was one nice example where the teacher had heard something on the radio about football players during COVID suggesting that maybe they wouldn't take a salary cut because that would reduce their taxation bill and surely that would be bad for the country. So as a class group, they all explored this and found out you know, some of the actual data. Um, and likewise, in another classroom, um, a young person was, had, um, had broken their arms and there was a discussion about, well, what would this actually cost the country? Um, you know, how much does medicine cost and what would happen if we didn't have a health service? Um, so that, so in that ca those cases, there was something a little bit more um, positive about the young people's voices and their interests um, being listened to. There are a small number of teachers who do have this kind of pedagogic and professional courage and they, they do determinedly make spaces to do some of the activities that we've suggested from the professional learning. And this comes from some teachers in Leeds actually that we've um, worked with um, to, to design a refugee camp. And it's, it's, a, it's quite a complicated activity and the teacher spent a lot of time preparing to use it. Um, and then introduced it, as we'd suggested in the teacher's notes, with quite a lot of background about issues around migration, data, what some of the vocabulary means, asylum seekers, economic migrants, etc. Um, and as he was engaged in this introduction, a little voice from the back of the classroom um, spoke up and said, excuse me, are we in a maths class here or is this PSE or social subject? So we come back again to the issue of just what is the nature of mathematics and what is the purpose of what we're doing in school? Is it around something very kind of abstract and procedural that you're going to learn to pass an exam because you just want to use that certificate to buy you some other experience in life? Or is mathematics about being able to understand our world better and develop the quantitative literacy to engage with issues that are all around us um, and that we need to make sense of? And what I'm finding with the teachers is that whilst they might believe very strongly that mathematics is about the latter, there's such a strong discourse in schools that it's about the former that they're really struggling to find the space to bring in the kinds of things that they would like to do. Thank you. Thank you, Corrine. And uh, really interesting again, and, and a really nice transition between uh, initial teacher education into in-service teacher education. So um, our final presentation is entitled Teacher Education for Sustainability and Global Citizenship, a focus on in-service teachers. And providing this presentation is um, well, uh, but behind the presentation is uh, Anna Isabel Andrade, who is full professor at the Department of Education and Psychology at the University of Aveiro, um, Portugal. Um, I don't think Anna is with us today, but Monica and Francisco are. So Monica Lorenzo is a researcher and teacher educator at the University of Aveiro in Portugal. And Francisco Parancha de Silva is a PhD research fellow at the University of Aveiro as well. So uh, you're very welcome. Okay, thank you very much. So good afternoon. Uh, and uh, just, we are going to present uh, the project Teacher Education for Sustainability. And uh, to outline our presentation, in the first part of this talk, we will present the uh, Erasmus Plus Project TEDS, which means Teacher Education for Sustainability, a three-year collaborative project which was coordinated by the University of Aveiro, and that started in 2019. Then in the second part, we will discuss the results of a case study, which was conducted with a group of in-service teachers in Portugal that participated in TED's outline, online uh, professional development course. Finally, we will present a reference framework for in-service teacher education, which was the final output of the TED's project. So some background on our on this study that we are presenting. Education, educating global citizens for a more sustainable world is one of the bedrocks of quality, quality education inscribed in the 2030 agenda and uh, therefore to develop 
and analyze programs for in-service teacher education is essential in order for us to understand how may teachers develop the necessary knowledge, skills, and the confidence to create and inspire others, namely students, their, pup their pupils, to build a more sustainable, inclusive, and uh, uh, fair future for all. So in our study, uh, we take as a reference point the concept of uh, sustainability, here defined by Gadotti as this uh, dynamic balance with others and with the uh, environment. Uh, it is the, the harmony between those we, who are different. Okay, so <clears throat> background on, on the project. Uh, this understanding of sustainability is at the art of the TEDS project, which an Erasmus Plus project, which involves the network of researchers, teacher educators, teacher educators and teachers from five, five European universities, and the, that ran from 2019 to 2022. The project aimed to contribute uh, to the construction of knowledge about education for sustainability, namely through the design, development, and evaluation of teacher education programs and the, the provision of a, of a framework for teacher education context, whose analysis should lead to the availability of a reference framework for programs and activities of teacher education. The project involved three phases. Uh, the first one, which was uh, the construction of a uh, EDUES framework, which emerged from a literature review and the characterization of teachers and teacher educators, social representations. The second phase uh, corresponded to the design, implementation, and evaluation of teacher education courses, including uh, act and research projects for EDUES in schools. And the third phase corresponded to the construction of a teacher education framework for EDUES and the, the dissemination of the project's results. So in the first phase of the project, the TED team built a framework for EDUES, for Education for Sustainability, that uh, resulted from the analysis of Polish documents in the different countries, the countries that from the, the project, as well as articles, dissertations, and theses on uh, education for sustainability. The teams used content analysis software and the, the UNESCO Education for Sustainability competence as categories. These are uh, systematic system, system thinking competence, anticipatory competence, normative competence, strategic competence, and the uh, uh, interpersonal competence. And uh, in the yeah, thank you. And uh, in the next phase, the second phase, all teams designed, implemented, and analyzed the set of uh, in-service teacher education programs on the themes of uh, uh, on the themes that you can see on the on the slide. These were then adapted by the other teams to provide training material for members of each context. The Portuguese team in particular developed a course around the themes of dialogue, diversity, and intercomprehension. The study we are presenting today and that uh, Monica will uh, better explain from now on, uh, this that we are presenting today reports on the results of this course, namely concerning the, its effects on the teachers that uh, participate. Okay, so moving on uh, to the study, um, I would like to let you know uh, which were our aims. So let me just move the slide. So our main aim was to understand the impact of the professional development course on in-service teachers' professional learning, focusing on changes that were related to their conceptualizations of education for sustainability and global citizenship education, on their pedagogical repertoires, on their understanding of the purposes of education and of teachers' role in a globalized and multicultural world, and on their motivation and commitment to teach according to sustainability principles. So the course was titled Education for Sustainability, Diversity, Dialogue, and Inclusion, and was developed between March and June uh, 2022. Um, the course was fully online and included both synchronous and asynchronous uh, sessions, totaling 50 hours. 
Um, so the course involved six steps and the most important, so the central, the core of the, of the, uh, of the training was the collaborative design implementation and then the presentation of educational projects in schools. Um, the participants were 20 in service teachers. They were all female, experienced, and over 40 from different levels of schooling, from pre-prime to upper secondary education, and from different subject areas. Uh, most of the teachers have never attended courses on education for sustainability or global citizenship education before, and they're mainly associated the concept of EDUS, education for sustainability, with the idea of respect for nature and for the planet. And of course, uh, all participants provided their region informed consent to participate in the study and also in terms of dissemination publications and also in conferences. Um, regarding methodology, we conducted a qualitative case study uh, where we collected the individual reflections that were written by the 20 teachers at the end of the course, so in June 2022. And these were analyzed using content analysis according to four categories. Uh, these four categories were uh, professional content knowledge, so knowledge about education for sustainability in its various dimensions of the key competence for sustainability, and knowledge of GC principles and methodologies. Also pedagogical knowledge of classroom organization, learning strategies, assessment methods, etc., and knowledge of educational ends, purposes, and values. So the guiding principles of education, goals and theory of education, and then self-knowledge. So their self-perception of their role, individual practices and theories, which allow them to define their future strategies and to demonstrate motivation to continue teaching for uh, sustainability and global citizens. Citizenship. So, uh, presenting the results, we're going to start with professional content knowledge. So, we saw from their reflections that they had developed a clear and wider understanding of education for sustainability and global citizenship education, discovering their multiple dimensions and also their intersections between the two. Um, initially, and as we have highlighted, most of the teachers associated EDUS with environment and nature. Um, however, after uh, the course, most of the teachers, they came to notice other dimensions that are fundamental in achieving sustainable development, such as the social or the economic dimensions. And this uh, enabled them to select project themes that they were already interested in. So it's interesting to see that they found, well, I'm interested about gender equality. So can this be linked to sustainability? Yes, it can. So they were interested and motivated and surprised to see other dimensions included as well in the concept of sustainability. So as this teacher said, education for sustainability is about much more than environment and nature is about changing attitudes and behaviors towards the environment capturing for human rights and social justice. Um, then regarding pedagogical knowledge, uh, we could see that the course also allowed teachers to expand their content knowledge, update their teaching practice, as well as to um, expand their pedagogical repertoires. And as a result of the course, and mainly of the action research projects they, they develop with their students, they really discovered these concrete possibilities, so strategies, approaches, and best practices to integrate IDUS and the key competencies for sustainability in the curriculum. And they considered this to be a very broad team. So they felt that by using, for instance, project-based approaches and working collaboratively with teachers from other subject areas, they could reach their goal of education for sustainability better. Uh, regarding knowledge of the educational uh, ends of education, we could see that the course also played an important role in helping teachers reflect about the major purposes of education. So what are we doing here? And consequently to reconsider also the demand of the teacher in a globalized world. And several teachers expressed a need for education to be rooted in values that lead to sustainability and global citizenship, such as human rights, social justice, and inclusion. And for teachers to promote in their students what they call the accountability for their actions and awareness and engagement in society. And they also felt that in order for these values to be promoted, schools needed to change. As mentioned by this teacher, 
uh, a school close to the world needs to be replaced by a school capable of developing students a sense of responsibility and local and global citizenship. And throughout the course, so the course was organized as a workshop. So the teachers have multiple opportunities to discuss, to reflect critically. They also have mentors. So teacher educators, they, each group of teachers had a mentor. And there were multiple possibilities for us to discuss with them online or face-to-face, -face, but mostly online, what they were experiencing and their difficulties and their problems. So this allowed them to become more aware of their capabilities and challenges and also to be more resilient and open to innovation and change. And they also, we also felt that they increased their commitment and also their motivation to integrate AGUS and GCE in their teaching practice. This was also triggered by the fact that they were able to conduct these action research projects to see the effects of their students also help them and also seeing the projects from their uh, colleagues in the training, they also help them to see that, yes, I really feel more capable as it, this teacher says here. So in short, we found that the course was useful in helping the 20 in-service teachers develop clearer conceptualizations of address and GCE, to learn how to approach these topics, and to gain confidence and motivation to teach them in a more meaningful and intentional manner. Yet also teachers expressed a need to continue their professional development on education for sustainable development. Uh, indeed, uh, most of the interviews that we conducted afterwards with the teachers, uh, which led to the development of multimodal case studies, which are available in video format and in different languages, show that this teacher professional development um, is a never ending process. So teacher educations need to continue and these courses need to continue in order to bear fruit. So they need to continue to be to update their work and also to feel the support of others and also their peers in school so that not the administrative part of their work gets uh, in the front of what they want to do. So we feel that it is therefore important to continue investing in teacher education. And according to the project's results, we also found that teacher education for sustainability should consider the representations and the discourses of teachers and teacher educators in an engaged, interdisciplinary, collaborative, and recursive way. So mobilizing teachers' previous knowledge, addressing uh, different, at different times new knowledge and new experiences without forgetting the context and articulating the practical dimensions of work with learners. So, and these ideas form the 10 principles of the framework for in-service teacher education, which was developed as a final product of the TEPS project. And we attempted through this framework to answer uh, this question. So what matters most in education for sustainability and how can we do it? So the framework includes an explanation of each principle and also one or two uh, activities, example activities that can be conducted in teacher education programs. And this would be available online very, very soon. We are just ultimating the validation of this framework. So that was what we wanted to share with you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Monica and Francisca. That was, uh, again, a really interesting presentation covering a lot of ground in, in 10 minutes or so. So um, I'd just like to say thank you to, to all our presenters. I think they've given um, everyone a lot of food for thought. So I'll just hand over to Kudsia, um to draw things to a close. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, and everyone for participating in this discussion. And uh, yeah, yes, uh, building on the argument that ESD is not a mechanical concept, rather very organic. So we need to take it as, a, as an organic concept. It should not be used as a fashionable term, rather more than that. So today, Research, uh, uh, in, uh, research presented today indicates the transdisciplinary character of ESD. We learned about its integration in English, as, uh, in the subject of English as a foreign language, mathematics, and in um, different teacher education courses. A presentation also showed that ESD is not an isolated concept. 
or rather it overlaps with the concept of global education because in two presentations, a reference to global education and development was clearly mentioned. Another thing that um, was very visible in presentation was a reference to action research. So it, uh, the, uh, today's presentations also show that action research, particularly critical action research has a natural affinity with sustainability education. And, the, um, and other thing which we learned from today's webinar was that it actually affirmed that individual teachers and teacher education educators in different parts of the world are addressing ESD and this is really encouraging. And even in mathematics, ESD is being addressed and we, we always talk about real world pedagogies and uh, in mathematics, it has very clear connection with real world application of mathematics. So um, a very interesting presentations and there are uh, a number of takeaway messages from today's presentations. So on behalf of the SIG conveners, I would like to thank the presenters for sharing their research. Thank you very much again for attending this webinar.